Officially, it's called long-term segregation. It's the ultimate prison nightmare. Locked away in solitary confinement in a bare cell, sometimes for years. You pace the room, you count the bricks, you think the most weird thoughts you can think of. You shout and you scream, you cry, you break down. Um, it has a devastating effect. Tonight, World in Action uncovers the secret silent world of long-term segregation and reveals that the Home Office has no idea what lasting damage this prolonged isolation may be doing to prisoners. We've obtained secret recordings from prisoners still inside a top security jail. Transferred without warning from prison to prison, they've been kept for long stretches of time in solitary confinement. Prisoners call this system of transfer and segregation the ghost train. Mark Leach rode the ghost train. He spent over two years being shunted frequently from one prison to another. He's still in prison, serving a six-year sentence for arson and other offences. He's now a successful writer. In a secret interview with World in Action, he describes the ghost train. The ghost train is a system whereby prison governors, in relation to prisons who they feel are subversive, um, can ship them around from prison to prison at periodic intervals. Um, you, you get no notice of when you're going, and that's why it's called the ghost train. Not only do you not know when you're going, you don't even know where you're going to. John Bowden is serving a 25-year sentence for murder. He's been in prison for 10 years, half of it being ghosted from jail to jail. This is his voice recorded in a top security prison. I have spent a total of five years in solitary confinement, over three years for one consecutive period, and have been transferred between prisons almost constantly. When the prisoner who complains too persistently is usually selected for the harshest treatment. During my longest period of being held in solitary confinement, I was also transferred between prisons every 28 or 56 days, from one end of the country to the other. I was never properly seen or examined by a doctor in order to assess my physical and psychological condition. I was quite simply left to rot in solitary. His last spell on the ghost train was short but dramatic. Like others, he found his reputation had travelled before him. Transferred out of Long Latin prison after a food protest, he was sent first to Winchester and put in solitary in the punishment wing, known as the Block. 28 days later, he was moved on to Winston Green Prison in Birmingham and taken to the Category A prisoner's wing. Bowden was summoned from his cell to be given a set of prison clothes. I gave my, my trousers a size, at which point, screaming and shouting abuse, he grabbed hold of the front of my shirt. I pulled back instinctively as a sort of defence mechanism, at which point the other prison officers surged around and attacked me. I was pushed back against the wall and then basically they just sort of forced me to the ground. All the time punches were being rained upon me, kicks were being rained upon me. Um, I was absolutely terrified. I mean, it was completely unprovoked. Prisoners' stories are often difficult to check, but this was different. There was a witness to some of what happened to Bowden. Hassan Khan was in Winston Green Prison that day. Convicted of robbery, he was later completely cleared by the appeal court and freed. There's a hole in the centre of the spy hole and I was watching through that. But as it settled down and they had him face down in the sterile cell, I could see that there was a um, screw sitting on the small of his back. His arms stretched out in front of him with a screw on each arm and his legs the same and a screw on each leg and another screw holding his hair and sort of talking into him. What was he saying? He was saying things like, you're a big man, but listen, uh, you think you're a big man, but you're nothing here. Now, shithead, when you get up, you're going to call me, sir. How them that this was protesting that they was killing him, that he couldn't breathe, and he was virtually just screaming and grunting off the punches and whatever they was doing to him, you know? Hassan Khan timed the beating at Winston Green Prison. It was over 20 minutes before Bowden was left alone in a cell. I was in considerable pain at this time, and it was a sort of pain that consumed every part of me. I wasn't sure how seriously I'd been injured, but at that point I was almost convinced that at least a couple of ribs were broken. It took me quite a while to sort of haul myself to my feet and sit on the edge of the bed. Bowden pressed the cell bell several times to ask for medical help. Eventually his calls were answered by a group of prison officers and he was removed from the cell. I was kicked constantly in the legs and the shins and the ankles. And there were rabbit punches applied to my body. And then I was then dragged into the segregation unit, <clears throat> taken into the strong box or special cell. 
I lie there, absolutely wrecked with pain. 45 minutes later, a doctor came and recorded Bowden's bruises and lacerations. An X-ray later confirmed he had a broken rib. I remained in that cell for the next two days. During the evening, they would throw a mattress in uh, and a blanket. And the following morning, they would take it out. A police inquiry followed, but no action was taken against any prison officer. Bowden, however, was charged under prison rules and punished for persistently ringing his cell bell and creating a disturbance. John Bowden has begun legal proceedings for damages. The Home Office is denying the assault. Bowden's transfer was authorised by a Home Office circular called 1074. It allowed governors to move a prisoner to a local jail for 28 days if they suspected him of stirring up trouble. The governor does not have to be able to prove any offence. This power used repetitively has kept prisoners on the ghost train for long periods. It's never been sanctioned by Parliament. Originally designed to deal with serious control problems, it's been put to much wider use by prison governors. Home Office instructions state it's not a punishment. Prisoners experience it differently. For Mark Leach and others on the ghost train, transfer also meant solitary confinement in the interests of good order or discipline. You're actually located in the punishment block despite the fact that you're not on punishment. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the Home Office say that prisoners who are on good order and discipline are not undergoing a punishment. Um, but that's, that's a falsehood. Y you are undergoing a punishment. You're locked in a punishment cell for 23 hours a day. And if you're unfortunate to go into a strip cell, as I later did, then it's 24 hours a day in, in brutal conditions. The constant moves with no notice mean that a prisoner's few possessions often get left behind. Take private cash. By the time it reaches prison B, you've moved on to prison C. And similarly with your property. You, you, you're, very, you're not given a great deal of, of time. You're not told when you're going on this ghost train. It's, they simply open the door, you pack what you've got, and in many cases it's simply your radio and your toiletries, and the rest will follow you eventually. The Home Office claims that a transferred prisoner in the punishment block enjoys more privileges than a prisoner there for punishment. But law professor Rod Morgan, a member of the Wolf Inquiry into the Strangeways riot, is not surprised that such a transfer would be seen as a punishment. Technically it is not, but it would be very surprising if prisoners were not to perceive it as a punishment, um, because it's usually taken as a measure in circumstances where allegations are being made about the behaviour of the prisoner which can't be proved, and secondly, after the administrative device has been resorted to, the conditions to which the prisoner is subject are the equivalent of those that they would be subject to if they were on punishment. But perhaps more serious than the physical conditions is the potentially damaging effect on the prisoner's mental health. Whilst you're in solitary confinement, your mental condition actually begins to deteriorate to the, to the point where you create non-existent friends, you actually begin to talk to yourself, you pace the room, you count the bricks, you think the most weird thoughts you can think of, you shout and you scream, you cry, you break down, um, it has a devastating effect, and this going on each and every day. Some prisoners who've suffered solitary confinement have been examined by psychiatrist Derek Russell Davis. It's an experience that prisoners come back to after many years. They remember it as being an extremely unpleasant, harrowing experience, which they've never completely got over. All the in the world, all the judicial reviews, all the boards of visitors, when you're actually sat there, they're light years away. The reality is that you are totally and utterly isolated. For Mark Leach, the nights in solitary were the worst. The most awful feeling when you're sat inside a cell at night and you hear people screaming and shouting. And they're screaming and shouting, they don't know why they're doing it. It's the pressure, they just cannot handle the pressure. Uh, and, and it's as a result of being so alone, they need to have somebody to come to their door to talk to them, just to say something, even if it's only a swear word, you know. Um, they, they need to have it, and they just absolutely, they just break down. Former prison officer John Sutton saw ghost train prisoners arrive at strange ways. They wouldn't really know exactly which prison they were in to start off with, because very often when they whisked away in the middle of the night like that, they're not told where they're going, otherwise they fight, and some of these people can fight. Once they arrived at strange ways, they, they, they may be on a silent regime. I mean, th then we enter into the informal 
curriculum of abuse whereby people are not fed so they may go two or three days without receiving a proper meal. What happens if a prisoner complains about this sort of treatment? Very little in my experience. Initially it, it, it is heard, I mean, and there is an inquiry and a governor would be appointed to look into it. But generally speaking, uh, if the complaint looks like it might be going somewhere, then the prisoner goes somewhere first, probably about two o'clock in the morning. Prisoners who spend long periods in solitary confinement find it very difficult to adjust to ordinary prison life. When they come out of segregation, they have quite considerable difficulties in getting on with people. They were withdrawn into a shell and they may find the company of other people intrusive, disturbing, not knowing what to do about it, wanting to, to really acting shy, wanting to get back into one shell again. Then once you actually start to talk to people again, then you get the repercussions. Um, and in my own particular case, they range from very severe, severe headaches to sore throats, not being able to concentrate, not being able to hold a prolonged conversation. Um, and you also tend to become paranoid of people around you. Do you know of any research that's been done by the Home Office into the effects of this sort of segregation upon prisoners? No, it's a striking thing about the whole of the prison regime is that they have got circumstances in which it would be very easy to do the research on the effects of the various procedures, but they have never con contemplated doing so. But this system has been in operation now for 17 years. Plenty of opportunities to, to do really quite systematic research on what the effects are on people. But for one reason or another, it's never been done. The ghost train emerged after the collapse of another controversial procedure to deal with disruptive prisoners. Called the control unit, one was opened here at Wakefield Jail. Prisoners were kept in isolation, completely segregated from other prisoners. And they were kept in... Um, a physical environment which um, involved fairly substantial sensory deprivation and they were kept there for a certain length of time and if they conformed to the rules within it then they were released but if they did not then they went back to square one and people kept realize that you could modify behavior by offering carrots or by brandishing sticks and I suppose it the good thing about the control unit was that it combined both approaches. The project was abandoned amidst a public outcry about its inhumanity. Virtually unnoticed, long-term segregation using 1074 took its place. In segregation, there's virtually no carrot at all. And what's worse, I think, is that the, uh, the prisoner has no idea when he's going to be let out, what he has to do even to f hasten his... Uh, release into the wider communities of prison. So, so there's no guidance at all to, to his behaviour. So you're saying that the, the, the system of long-term segregation that we have now is worse than the control unit system which was closed down as inhumane? Oh, I think so, yes. Yes, I think segregation is a very inhumane uh, thing to do. Chris Haig thought segregation was inhumane. He's still serving a 15-year sentence for armed robbery and decided to challenge a 1074 transfer from Parkhurst Prison to solitary confinement in Wormwood Scrubs. From a top security prison, he tells us what happened when he went out for exercise one day, unaware that, for him, it had been cancelled. So I went out. Now I'll go out past one screw on the exit door that ticks my name off on the board, past another two on the gate, onto the exercise yard with none of them at any stage until about an hour had passed, came up to me and said, you shouldn't be out here. And then a PO came up to me and said, look, I agree with your protest, but you're not supposed to be here. I said, well, I'm not making a protest. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be here. There was no charge, but he was punished anyway with a 1074 transfer straight into segregation. The next morning I woke up and I saw the cafe van pull in the yard and I knew it's for me. He ended up in the punishment block at Wormwood Scrubs, in isolation for 28 days and still not charged with any offence. Haig started legal proceedings to challenge the practice of a 1074 transfer going hand in hand with automatic solitary confinement. He won.
and last year the Home Office sent governors new instructions. No longer could the governor transferring the prisoner also decide that he would go into isolation. Now the decision is left to the receiving governor. There is supposed to be a safeguard. If segregation under prison rule 43 is for more than three days, it needs approval from the board of visitors charged with looking after prisoners' interests, but they rarely argue with a governor's decision. There is only one recorded instance where a member of a board of visitors has refused to authorise, for example, a Rule 43 decision, and that involved myself. And according to the major Home Office study conducted on boards of visitors in their watchdog role, that was the only instance that they could find of that ever happening. World in Action has discovered that despite the new safeguards, prisoners undergoing this type of transfer are still being sent straight into solitary confinement. Since last December, Dave Judd has been ghosted twice. Both times he went straight into the block. In just over two years, he's been transferred 14 times. But the ghost train doesn't just mean hardship for prisoners. It can also mean heartbreak for their families, as Dave Judd told World in Action inside a top security prison. I was sentenced to 18 years imprisonment for robbery. That was my punishment, to have my liberty taken away. Not to be abused, not to be uh, brutalised. Restrictions, not made just on me, but on my family. They're the ones who suffer. Obviously, they don't know what goes on because they would be shocked if I told them. And this is how I think that they get away with it in prison. I don't want to cause my family any more grief than I already have. I've had uh, 14 moves in the last two years. None of them have been for uh, any disciplinary uh, actions on my part. Contact with his family in London has been more difficult because his father has been seriously ill and undergone heart surgery. When Dave arrived at nearby Wormwood Scrubs, they were delighted. The first few visits went well, then things changed. We went all the way up there, and I wasn't feeling very well that morning. I had a, a job to get up the steps of the mm. station, you know, we had mm. to stop, didn't we? Mm. And um, it really was a bad day that day, you know. I was having one of be bad off day. days. Mm. And um, we got to the gate, put the Theo through the window, and the bloke looked, you know, and said, he's not here. Just like that. I said, oh, um, we'll, we'll come and visit him. He, he's gone. And he wouldn't tell us where he'd gone. No, he wouldn't tell he us where he'd gone. I said, well, when did he go? He said, this morning. And that's, that's the sort of treatment you get from them people. You know, if they turn around and say, well, I'm sorry, Mr Judd, he, he was moved out this morning, unfortunately, but you don't get that sort of treatment. That morning, Dave Judd had been moved to Franklin Prison in Durham, 300 miles away and the most northerly prison in England. What were your initial feelings when you discovered that he'd been transferred from Wormwood Scrubs to Franklin, hundreds of miles? Oh. Oof. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, well, we to will, which you gut, gutted. Mm. Um, absolutely pushed down. Um, and that set you back a bit, didn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. that made me ill. Yeah, that made me ill. When, when the phone call came through and they told me, you know, um, it was just like uh, somebody slapping you in the face, you know. Um, well, it did to me anyway. Um, I think I went to bed for two or three days, didn't I? Mm. I mean, they're loved ones, but all love leaves you as soon as that visit finishes. I mean, I'm waiting for a visit. Uh, in, in between visits, you have no love. There is, uh, there's no feeling. You're in a, the hate factory, uh, and it's just pure hatred. There's no uh, feelings, affection whatsoever. And for a man to serve so many years and expect to go out uh, a normal person is ridiculous. The Home Office admitted this week that no research had been done into the damage that long-term segregation may cause. They said... The services efforts have been concentrated on options which are regarded as more appropriate and relevant, rather than on studying the effects of long-term segregation. Well, I'm accustomed to a situation in medicine where every procedure is subjected to some kind of trial to compare with not giving the procedure to see what actually happens. Uh, but, and we're dealing in prison with some pretty drastic procedures have major effects on people, yet they've never been researched.
Is that right? No. It's, I, I think it's indefensible. One man's experiences on the ghost train may soon come to haunt the Home Office. Andy Cunningham is suing them over the treatment he received when he was shipped out of Parkhurst Prison. After a dispute over a family visit, Cunningham, serving an eight-year sentence for robbery, assaulted a prison officer, emptying a slop bucket over him. He went through the usual disciplinary procedures, but that wasn't all. I was taken to the segregation unit in Parkhurst Prison, and um, about two, three hours later, I was transferred to Camp Hill Prison. At Camp Hill, he found himself in a strip cell on the punishment block. I was told that what happened in the other prison, they, they didn't want to know about that. The following day, I was being moved to another prison. Um, so I went to sleep that night. The next morning, at about seven o'clock, half seven, the door opened and um, a nose pipe was put on me, cold water was sprayed over me and I was, I was asleep at the time. About two hours later, the door opened again and about eight screws came in, just started hitting me with the truncheons and booting me. I put my arm up and one of them went to hit me on the head. And uh, the result was it resulted in a broken arm. When I left the cell, I, I was semi-conscious. I tried moving the arm, but it was just, I was in terrible pain. I rang the bell and um, I've asked for a doctor, you know. And what did they say? Well, I was told that uh, when we're finished with you, it won't be a doctor you'll be needing, it'll be the undertaker, you know, which... Uh, which... which uh, well, I was frightened at the time, you know, when I heard that. I mean, I can do what I want, can't I? And in places, when you're down a block and you're the only one now, I mean, you're in their hands, they can do what they want with you. An hour, two hours, and uh, I just all pulled into the cell. I just pulled on top of me, and they just twisted my arm about what was broke when I was lying on the floor. But they placed me in a body belt, which is, um, it's a leather belt with a metal handcuff on each side. You can't move, you know, your arms are in a metal cuff each side of you. I had no clothes on at all. I was then carried out of the segregation unit and just thrown into the back of the transit van. I was just on the floor and they were sitting on top of me with their boats in the back, some of them, and just transferred to Pentonville Prison. But even after the 120 mile journey, his ordeal was not yet over. I was placed in a strip cell overnight, you know which is a cell of absolutely nothing in it, you know. And the, uh, the body belt was left on me. That wasn't taken off until the following day. At nearby Whittington Hospital, it was confirmed his arm was broken. The rest of his sentence was served the hard way, moving from prison to prison 16 times, often straight into solitary confinement. Andy Cunningham is now suing the Home Office, who are denying the assault. Seven weeks ago, we asked the Home Secretary and the prison's minister to appear in this film. We were told... Ministers do not wish to take part. We also asked for permission to film in punishment blocks. We were refused. At every prison, this official declaration is on display. A commitment to treat prisoners with humanity. But in some of our prisons, the words and the reality may be far apart. That's what you could perhaps call in industry a mission statement. But as far as prisons are concerned, it's just a whitewash. It's nothing more than camouflage. Um, it's the image that the Home Office Prison Department likes to project to the public. But of course, the public, whilst they may see the visiting rooms and the outside of the prison gates where these signs are portrayed, don't see what actually goes on behind the closed prison doors of a punishment block.